In my denomination, it's often like, we're not sure if God exists, but we are sure that God supports LGBTQ. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. Actually, the church is over there. I'm working on my university today, and I'm almost done with the outside, so I'm going to be doing a bit of interior design today. I'm going to be building the different rooms in this university, so that should be pretty fun. It's a bit crowded in here because everyone decided to show up for the video. This is a real Christian Minecraft server where all of us come and build churches together build churches for the glory of God to symbolize how we're supposed to build the church in real life. This is not meant to be a substitute for going to church in real life. This is just to, meant to show the beauty of the church. And there is a lot of beauty of the church, but I've seen some ugly things in my specific denomination. So I am a Presbyterian. I'm part of the PCUSA. It's not the only Presbyterian denomination, but it's the largest denomination, and it's also famous for being liberal. Now, it's not entirely true that the whole denomination is liberal. There are many pastors in the denomination who are trying to fight the liberalism. And by the way, when I say liberalism, I mean theological liberalism. It has nothing to do with politics, although there is overlap. But generally, theological liberalism just means taking the claims of the faith less seriously. And... I'll show some very striking examples of that. So theological liberalism, it's not like uh, you're a Christian, but you voted for Obama or something. It has nothing to do with that. It's literally denying that Jesus rose from the dead, or some cases denying that God exists at all. I've seen some crazy things in my denomination. So I'm going to tell you guys some things I've seen in my denomination. Most of the craziest things were when I went on a confirmation retreat. So when I was getting confirmed in my church, like... My church was not one of the more liberal ones in the denomination, so I was not quite exposed to all the craziness in my denomination right from the beginning, and I was unaware of it at first. But then I went to a confirmation retreat, which was not hosted by my church, but was hosted by the local presbytery. The presbytery is kind of like a regional government in the Presbyterian church, and some presbyteries are more conservative or liberal than others. It's, it surprises a lot of people, but even in the PCUSA, which overall has voted that churches may do gay marriages if they want, the entire presbytery of San Diego, which is surprising because San Diego is like a liberal area in general, the entire presbytery of San Diego has rejected that decision. So there are conservative presbyteries in my denomination, but the presbytery I was in, in like the suburbs of New York City, that wasn't one of them. So my local presbytery is very liberal. And to this day, my church is the only church in our entire presbytery that does not fly a pride flag in June during Pride Month. So I went to this confirmation retreat having no idea what theological liberalism even was. Like, remember, I was only, I think I was 16 at the time, so I was just learning to figure out my faith, but I did know the basics of the faith. I had been a Christian for a couple years, and I had a general understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. Um, one of the things about being, Christ about being Christian that I knew about was, you believe in God. And that should be like a no-brainer, like even an atheist would most likely admit that you need to believe in God to be a Christian. But I found that that isn't as obvious as you would think it is, especially in these more liberal churches. So when I went on this weekend confirmation retreat, I could tell something was off right from the beginning. Actually before the beginning, because they had given us a little brochure about the event, and I was reading it on the car drive over, and it said something like, do you believe there are right or wrong answers about God? Implying that, no, there are no right answers about God. And I was like, okay, this seems a little bit liberal over here. So then we got there, and something I noticed right away about the other kids is none of them seem to actually care about this God stuff. A lot of them seem to just be going because their parents made them. And the guy I was sharing a bunk with, he was really creepy. He said he was like a Nazi and stuff, and he said he was a total atheist, and he was only going because his mom said she would take away his iPad if he didn't go. And most of the kids there were like 12, and I was more like 16. It's because most of those kids were being confirmed because their parents wanted them to be. And I was actually going on my own will because I had converted at a much later age to Christianity. But most of the kids really didn't seem to care about it. So we, I was hoping that this trip would change the hearts of those kids. But it was clear from the beginning that was not going to happen. Because on the first night, we all gathered around a circle and they started singing some guitar songs. And, you know, that's actually very normal. But these songs were not inspiring. 
The first was called Dream God's Dream, about God dreaming of a better world. The second was, How could anyone ever tell you you are anything less than beautiful? And I could feel the cringe in the room. It was like cringe had a physical substance that we were being bombarded with. So the next day they started talking about the Bible, saying we don't need to take it literally. I understand some people saying that, okay, maybe uh, Genesis 1 isn't literal history. Fine. But then they were talking about things like the resurrection. So I was like, wait, do you guys seriously not believe in the resurrection? And one of the pastors there's, there said, oh, I believe like something happened to inspire the disciples. But I don't believe that there was actually a, someone rising from the dead. And I was like, guys, I've seen my grandmother do miracles, okay? If my grandma can do it, I think Jesus can also do a miracle, okay? And also on that confirmation trip, something they did, it was, uh, this is one of the less severe things. This just came to mind. A lot of people know the song Father Abraham, like Father Abraham had many sons and many sons had Father Abraham. I'll actually sing that for you right now. I'm really the best singer ever. Everyone tells me that. So instead of just doing Father Abraham had many sons, we did one verse with that, but they needed to be gender inclusive. So then the next verse was Father Abraham had many daughters and many daughters had Father Abraham and I am one of them or, and so are you. And then they said Mother Sarah had many sons and many sons had Mother Sarah. And the fourth verse was Mother Sarah had many daughters and many daughters had Mother Sarah. Like that's not one of the big problems. I, thought, I just thought that was kind of funny. But the thing is they weren't gender inclusive enough. Where was the verse that said um, uh, Father Abraham and Mother Sarah had many, like, non-binary uh, cloud gender individuals? Like, that verse was missing, so I think even the PCUSA is probably kind of transphobic, to be honest. Like, maybe we need to... You know, here's my advice. If you're watching this and you're, like, theologically liberal, the PCUSA is not progressive enough, so you guys should probably split off and make a brand new, like, Unitarian gender unicorn progressive denomination. You need to split off from the Presbyterian Church because there's still conservatives. I heard of this one conservative guy called Redeem Zoomer who's still in the PCUSA, so um, if you want to really be, like, an ally, you should probably get out of it. Anyway, uh, just in case I, for my, I do have liberal viewers of this, of this channel, and um, people all over the, you know, spectrum of liberal to conservative, and I've talked about recently, I don't really like calling myself a conservative much anymore, not because I disagree with what conservatives believe, but because conservative is always like you're trying to go back in time, and we can't do that, and there's a reason conservatives always lose. So I think we should call ourselves progressive, but just redefine progressive as progressing towards a Christian society that we want to build, not progressive as in what the progressives want to do. Society is always progressing, but it's either progressing in a good direction or a bad direction. Right now it's progressing in a bad direction. We need to make it progress in a good direction. And I am out of material for right now uh, for, for building this. So I'm going to start working on the walls over here so that I can make this. So I'm going to make different rooms in this university, like for like theology or apologetics. Uh, I don't really know what I'm going to do. I might add like a music wing because I'm a musician. I like the, the music. Okay, so those are two of the things that happened on the confirmation trip. And the third thing I remember from my confirmation trip is I was at lunch with a bunch of pastors. And I don't know how this got brought up. I think one of the pastors could sense that I was a bit more conservative. So he was like, yeah, what's it like being a conservative in this denomination, given that this is a liberal denomination? And I was a bit taken aback because remember, at that time, I had no idea how liberal the denomination was. But I was just like, you know, yeah, it's hard. I am a conservative. I, I get in trouble at school for being pro-life. And then a couple of the pastors, a couple of these female pastors, heard me say that I was pro-life. And they just totally flipped on me. And one of them was like, you cannot tell me what to do with my body. And I, like, I was not looking for an argument there, but she gave me one. So I responded. I wasn't afraid. And then another one of the pastors there, um, she said that, like, unborn children are parasites. It's like, how on earth can you be a pastor and say something like that? How on earth can you be a pastor and deny the divinity of Christ? But the reason that these people are pastors is not out of a passion to serve the Lord. It's a really sad thing, but for the past, like, hundred or so years, there's been a in, there's been an intentional movement to hijack the mainline churches from the outside 
because the church, the, the um, cultural Marxists saw the mainline churches as a cultural threat, these mainstream historically rooted churches. So there's been an intentional agenda to hijack these churches from the outside. So people ask, why do people become pastors in these denominations if they don't even believe Jesus is real? Um, and again, this is still a minority of the pastors. Even though the majority of the pastors in my denomination are liberal in some ways, most of them are not this liberal. This was a special case. But in all these cases, it is an intentional hijack. So yeah, this pastor called unborn children parasites. This pastor, she also called Tim Keller a fundamentalist. And it's like, in most of my uh, evangelical friends circles, they think Tim Keller is like a liberal Marxist. Uh, guys, Tim Keller was not a, a liberal. Because I, I've seen liberal and they hated Tim Keller and they called him a fundamentalist. So that was the third thing. The fourth and probably the worst of all thing I witnessed at this confirmation trip is they had this section at the end where it's like, what does Jesus mean to you? Uh, Jesus asked, who do, you, who do you say I am? And when Jesus asked, who do you say I am? There was a clear, you know, correct answer to that question. Because once St. Peter got the answer correct, Jesus said like, you are blessed for believing this because God has revealed this to you. But they made it completely open-ended, and they were like, you know, traditionally Christians think Jesus is God, but not everyone believes that. Pastor, pastor Brian over here doesn't believe Jesus is God. So, there was a pastor who was leading a confirmation trip who did not believe that Jesus was truly God. That is the basic belief of Christianity. You cannot be a Christian. If you don't believe Jesus is God, it's it shouldn't be that complicated. And even I, I know a lot of atheists would probably agree with me on that because you know if you don't believe in the most basic idea of the religion, you can't really say you're a part of that religion. But like I said, the the reason that people like that exist is because there has been an intentional hijack of these institutions and denominations from the outside. So although I'm very upset by it, I'm not surprised. And anytime I tell people this. They're always like, their initial reaction is, you have to get out of that denomination, you have to run. No, the reason it got this bad is because people run. People run away, and then it gets worse, and then more people run away, and it gets worse. We need to stop that. So, I know not everyone agrees with me on this. Some people think you should just run anyway, and we all have to just run and wait for Jesus to come back. If that's your opinion, keep it to yourself, because I've debated this with many people many times. You're not going to say anything I haven't heard already. I'm staying in this denomination because this needs to stop. False teachers need to be called out, as the Bible says, and if you run, you're not actually removing them, you're actually making them stronger, you're just giving them more freedom to keep spewing their false teaching. So I'm not running, I'm going to confront them, and that's what I've been doing by trying to coordinate uh, Operation Reconquista, which is the movement to restore the mainline churches back to the Bible and back to Christ. So those were all the things I saw on my confirmation trip, all those crazy things. But there were other things I saw in the denomination not necessarily on my confirmation trip. So like I said, my church specifically right now, it's not one of those liberal churches. We don't fly a pride flag. Our pastor preaches the gospel every Sunday. And that's why I'm okay with staying in the denomination. Like if there were no churches like my church, that would be a different story. But even in these liberal denominations, you still find churches within them that hold to the official teachings of the denomination rather than like going off, off, the, off script and not following the confessions. But... My church wasn't always like that, because before my current pastor arrived, we had an interim pastor, and she basically was a heretic. She also said, on Easter Sunday, it doesn't matter if the resurrection literally happened or not. What matters is, I don't know, the resurrection inspiring us to do social justice or whatever. I don't know, something like that. But she, we had a heretical liberal pastor before my current pastor. But luckily, a few of us who were horrified by what she was saying banded together and wrote to the pastor nominating committee saying, the next pastor we get has to not be like this. The next pastor we get needs to believe the gospel, needs to believe the Bible, needs to believe all of this is real. And it's true, the next pastor we got was a, you know, biblical reformed Christian. And it's not like our church still doesn't struggle with liberalism. It's still a fight every June over whether we're going to fly a pride flag. And we still don't. 
but it's not like our church is completely perfect now. But we did replace a heretical pastor with a non-heretical pastor, so it is possible if you just stand up for truth. It's not possible if you keep running away, because running away is a never-ending game. But like I said, so we did have this pastor who was kind of heretical, and she once preached an entire sermon about why we shouldn't believe the Bible. An entire sermon about why we shouldn't believe the Bible. And her reason, her reasoning was the most ridiculous reason I've ever heard. So she basically quoted the story from Genesis of like Jacob wrestling with God, and that's how he earned the name Israel, and Israel means like struggling with God. Now, the traditional interpretation of that story is pretty obvious. The reason that we struggle with God as believers is because we're sinners. So the problem is with us, not with God. Believers, true believers, do struggle with God, but it's because the believers are sinful and God is trying to purify them of their sin. That's where the struggle is. The struggle is because of our fault, not God's fault. The way she interpreted that verse is... It's good to struggle with God, and it's good to question the Bible. That's how she interpreted that. So the problem is basically, it's basically God's fault for not writing a good enough Bible, and we need to struggle with the Bible and question it. And she's, she said, like, saying I believe the Bible is like saying I believe the New York Public Library. And what she meant by that is the Bible is not one consistent narrative. The Bible is just like a collection of contradicting narratives and books from all different times and places. Now, honestly, if someone really isn't saved, if someone is unregenerate, I almost don't blame them for thinking that, because people who read the Bible in faith can see the overarching message of Christ throughout all the scriptures. Um, but I, I believe that the Bible isn't the word of God for unbelievers in the same sense that it is the word of God for believers, because the Bible is the word of God because the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us through the Bible. But this Holy Spirit isn't revealing Christ to an unbeliever. That's why I say, like, Jewish people, even though they have, like, the text of the Old Testament, I don't think they have the Word of God, because they don't believe in Christ, and the whole purpose of the Bible is the witness to Christ. So while they would have the biblical texts, the Word of God is not speaking to them through those biblical texts. So I, because my pastor clearly was not a believer at that time, I almost don't blame her for not seeing that the Bible is one overarching narrative because only the only those with true faith in Christ can really see the overarching narrative. I've heard stories of people saying they read the Bible as an atheist and it made no sense to them, it seemed like just a bunch of outdated fairy tales, and then suddenly they became a believer and suddenly it all made sense to them, it all clicked, all the puzzle pieces came together. But yeah, basically this pastor's sermon was doing the exact opposite of what a pastor was is supposed to do. What a pastor is supposed to do is to preach the word of God to their congregation and to show the congregation why the message of Christ matters. To preach the message of Christ by exegeting the scriptural passages. Exegete just means taking a passage and explaining what it means. And it's very important for people in the church to hear the word preached. But what she was doing was the opposite of preaching the word. She was intentionally um, and knowingly casting doubt on the word of God. So, I I really hope she repents, because if she doesn't, eh, she needs to repent for that. But um, that's not even the silliest thing that happened at my specific church, because while she was our pastor, um, she invited this, um, this other lady who was called... And the exact words, her exact description is a feminist biblical scholar, so you know it's already going to be bad. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be political here. It would be just as, like, um, it, it would be just as suspicious if someone came to church and they were, like, I don't know, a Republican biblical scholar who tried to find prophecies about Trump and Revelation. That would be just as suspicious. So if someone's, like, a feminist biblical scholar or, like, a, a queer biblical scholar... It's obvious, just based on their title, that their goal isn't trying to be faithful to Scripture. It's trying to read their own personal agenda into Scripture. They'll often admit that that's what they're doing. So this feminist biblical scholar gave this lecture on Genesis, and basically she spent an entire hour saying that um, Genesis 1 says we should care about the environment, which is true, because, you know, we are given dominion over the earth. We are supposed to care for the earth. Uh, you didn't really need an hour to say that. 
You could. I, I just said that just now. It took me 10 seconds. Maybe that's just because she's a woman. Women often say things that could be said in 10 seconds in an hour. But, um, so yeah, that's not her fault specifically. But she was analyzing Genesis 1-1, that verse where it says, the in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And something really interesting about that verse is that the word for God is plural, Elohim. That, that's the plural form of the Hebrew word God. But then the verb created, when it says God created the heavens and the earth, that's conjugated in the singular form. So there's an interesting paradox of singular and plural. So she was like, does anyone know what this means? And I whispered to my dad, it's the Trinity. And then right after that, she said, now I hope you're not a fundamentalist who's going to say it's the Trinity. And I was like, uh, it's, you think it's fundamentalist to believe in the Trinity? So in the, the Q&A afterwards, like some people asked some questions, I forget what they asked. But my question was, okay, why is it fundamentalist to believe that Genesis 1 is talking about the Trinity? And she was like, oh, because the Jewish people don't have any concept of the Trinity. And they wrote the, okay, if you think the Bible is the word of God, it almost doesn't matter what the original authors were thinking about in their own minds when they were writing the verse. What was Moses or whoever wrote that verse thinking when he wrote down the verse? I don't know. I wasn't there. But it's the word of God. So we can still discern what the meaning of the text is, even if we don't have like a probe into the mind of the author. It's not to say that the intent of the author doesn't matter at all, because cultural context is like important and all that. But she was saying basically that the Bible is not the word of God and that it's fundamentalist to assert that the Bible is the word of God. I can see why those pastors on my confirmation retreat called Tim Keller a fundamentalist because to them it seems like any pastor who actually believes any of this is real is a fundamentalist. So all that being said, I'm not telling you guys this to try and hate my denomination because I love my denomination. That's why I want to restore it. That's why I'm doing this Reconquista thing. I'm just trying to tell people how bad it is and how we need to fix this because whether or not we're in these nominations these liberal pastors are these liberal pastors are still part of the visible church and they're still giving people the wrong idea of christianity by spewing this heresy so leaving these denominations doesn't make them go away it makes them stronger and to this day people still see them as representatives of christ even if they're not because to this day, there will still be like New York Times headlines that says, oh, this pastor of this old historic Episcopal church says the virgin birth isn't a, a true thing. Like that's, that's actually happened. And if we let the leaders of these old historic churches that are seen as credible in the eyes of the culture, that are seen as representatives of Christianity in the eyes of the culture, if we let heretics take them over, then there will still be people falsely speaking for Christ, spewing things that are contradictory to the message of Christ. So that's why I say we can't run away from these mainline denominations. It's not a it's not a masculine or a biblical mindset to say you need to run away at the first sign of struggle. We need to fight for the gospel, just like Martin Luther did. And I'm going to quote the motto of my denomination, which is reformed and always reforming according to the word of God.